Thank you. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, I would like to kindly thank uh, Velux for giving us the opportunity to present uh, the results of our study in such an inspiring conference. Um, oh, sorry. Um, what I'm going to talk about uh, today is a uh, part of uh, my thesis which I conducted at the Technical University of Denmark uh, while working together with uh, Microshade AS. Um, Hel Folje Rasmussen from Microshade has been supervising me through the process. And um, a, lot of, a significant part of the study evolved around uh, evaluating the daylight performance of different shading technologies. Uh, and this is what I'm going to uh, discuss, uh, discuss about with you today. Uh, a good question to start, to start with is uh, why are daylight evaluation methods important or interesting to talk about? Um, well, all uh, the presentations we've seen so far have extensively proven that daylight is a key element in sustainable design, so I, I don't really need to expand on that. Um, at the same time, uh, building regulation requirements uh, set increasingly higher standards for the performance of buildings, which uh, has made solar shadings uh, a more commonly used uh, feature in, in uh, sustainable design, and therefore it's important uh, to correctly evaluate uh, the performance of shadings in terms of daylight. Uh, most commonly, uh, shadings have been uh, taken in account in energy and thermal performance uh, assessments, not so much in daylight assessments. Um, furthermore, um, regulations, uh, regulation requirements and their prescriptive methods uh, usually, leave, uh, in most cases, leave a lot of space to produce poor daylight design. Um, and if we can summarize that all in a line, we can say that uh, basically there's a great need for well-informed daylight design uh, to design buildings sustainably and to create livable spaces. Um, why do regulations leave space for, uh, to create poor daylight design? Uh, well, this has been mentioned several times already, so I'm not going to expand on that a lot. Uh, Regulations rely uh, mostly on setting minimum standards of daylight factor, which is a metric that uh, assumes overcast sky conditions, and it takes no account of location, orientation, the dynamic sky conditions, and as we're going to show, in some cases, it takes no account of solar shading. Um, the, the past few years' research has obviously, as you know, brought to light uh, climate-based daylight modeling. Uh, we have the pleasure of having uh, some of the developers of the idea in this room, which is amazing. And um, uh, we, uh, climate-based daylight modeling can be translated into different um, daylight metrics. As an example, we're giving the daylight autonomy and the useful daylight illuminance, which the previous presenters discussed as well. Uh, just briefly to uh, remind what those means, what those mean, uh, daylight autonomy. Um, expresses a percentage of hours per year where uh, the daylight illuminance in a space is above 200 lux in our case, but this threshold can be modified according to the desired illuminance levels in the space. And useful daylight illuminance expresses a percentage of hours per year where the daylight illuminance in the space is either below 100 lux or between 100 to 2000 lux or higher than 2000 lux. So basically, it's divided in three sub-indicators. The lowest, the lowest threshold indicator reveals the need for artificial lighting. Uh, the 100 to 2,000 lux range um, has been uh, the outcome of uh, several studies, and it's a, a comfort range, range for occupants. Whereas uh, UDI above 2,000 uh, reveals that there is a risk for, uh, of glare. Uh, in our case study, we assess the performance of different uh, solar shadings in an open plan office with a south orientation located in Copenhagen. And uh, the only parameter, we, uh, we, we kept all parameters the same and only changed the solar shading each time. Um, the metrics we used, we're using to uh, present to you the results here today are the daylight autonomy, the useful daylight illuminance, and the daylight factor. And the software program we used was DaySim. Um, so the first uh, shading solution we examined was Microshade. Um, Microshade is a fixed interpane uh, solution with a dynamic behavior. It consists of uh, a, a microperforated 
uh, stainless steel film which is attached in the inner side of the external glazing pane. Uh, and the micro perforations have uh, such an inclination as you can, I don't know if you can actually see. Anyway, the par micro perforations have uh, an inclination that allows uh, for, higher, for uh, stronger shading when the sun is higher and uh, more daylight access from lower solar angles. Um, the second solution we examined was external dynamic Venetian blinds. Uh, because we tested the, the shadings in, um, uh, in the different contexts as well, in terms of energy performance and thermal performance, we wanted them to have a competitive behavior amongst each other, and therefore we used a very energy efficient strategy uh, for the dynamic shadings. Uh, that means we used them only when there was risk for overheating, and we set them to be activated when the sensors in the facade detected uh, radi direct radiation of 50 watts per square meter. Also, for this specific uh, uh, technology, we use the cut-off strategy of the lamellas. Uh, uh, basically, we set the lamellas to be inclined just as much as it was needed to uh, block direct radiation for the lower solar angles, angle of the months with overheating. Uh, the third uh, technology that we assessed was uh, dynamic roller blinds, following the same principle uh, in, in terms of uh, when they were in use, so only when uh, there was direct radiation in the facade, and, and also, again, sorry, during months with overheating. And lastly, we also assessed the performance of, solar, of a fixed uh, interpane solution of solar control coating. Uh, the graph here, uh, shows the, the results of the daylight autonomy, useful daylight illuminance, and daylight factor. Uh, the daylight factor is shown in red, and what is interesting to note is that uh, the clear glazing has exactly the same, same daylight factor as the two dynamic solutions, the Venetian blind and the roller blind. And this is explained by the fact that these solutions, as I just mentioned, were only in use when there was direct radiation uh, detected on the facade. Therefore, when running a daylight factor simulation, um, uh, these blinds were not drawn at all since only diffuse radiation was taken into account. Um, at the same time, uh, the, the fixed solutions, microshade and the soil control glass, have a significantly lower daylight factor uh, with, uh, with, with com in comparison to the rest of the shadings. Uh, however, the daylight autonomy in green uh, is uh, rather high for the clear glazing in the Venetian blinds, but slightly lower for microshade and, the, and soil control coating. We can see that there is almost a 60% reduction in the daylight factor, but almost a 10% reduction in their daylight, daylight autonomy. Um, the, the dynamic roller blind has a rather lower daylight autonomy, and this uh, basically uh, highlights the strong shading effect of the fabric which blocks both diffuse and direct radiation. Uh, and had we not used uh, the, this solution only during months of overheating, the daylight autonomy would have been even lower. Um, another interesting thing to point out is uh, the useful daylight illuminance of 100 to 2,000 lux, which is shown in black. It does show a different behavior for each of the cases. Um, and another interesting point is that Microshade has the lowest daylight factor, but the highest useful daylight illuminance, followed by the solar control glass. And we can also see that the clear glazing and the, the roller blind have the lowest useful daylight illuminance. Uh, the next graph can sh shed a bit more light on that. Uh, here we can see the three sub-indicators of useful daylight illuminance broken down for, this, uh, for solutions and the clear glazing. Uh, as I mentioned, the clear glass and the roller blinds have the, sm uh, the smallest percentage of useful illuminance, but for the opposite reasons, as we can see here, um, the roller blinds have too many hours of darkness within the year, in shown in the gray part, whereas the clear glass has too many hours of exceeded illuminance, as expected, uh, within the year. Uh, also, it's interesting to note that um, there's a... Um, Usually, uh, the static shadings are, um, are uh, prevented because of the fact that it's believed they're going to cause a lot more dark darkness uh, in their space. However, we can see that the hours of low illuminance levels in the year are exceeded by about 2 to 5% for the soil control glass 
and microshade. Also, uh, what is uh, also interesting to see is that uh, the useful daylight illuminance index highlights, uh, reflects uh, the fact that the dynamic blinds and microshade actually deal with, uh, uh, with blocking direct light. Uh, for the case of the Venetian blinds, we would have um, a higher useful daylight illuminance of 100 to 2000 if we had used uh, the blinds during the whole year. Um, to reach a conclusion, the things I would like to highlight are is uh, that the solution with the lowest daylight factor achieved the highest useful daylight illuminance and at the same time presented to have an adequate daylight autonomy. Uh, had we have followed uh, the different methods, so the daylight factor method instead of the climate-based daylight modeling method, we would probably have reached different design decisions. So therefore, climate and location do play a significant role, um, as well as uh, does taking solar shading into account. And therefore, it's vital to use the right daylight criteria to assess shadings and daylight in general. Uh, and this should be reflected in building regulations and building performance schemes. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>